This is the third part of my video series on pulse tube cryocoolers. In this video, I'll be altering different aspects of the design from my previous video and investigating the performance of different materials, the effect of pressurizing my working fluid, comparing a pulse tube to a Stirling cooler, and looking at the effect of a double inlet valve. While I didn't manage to exceed my previous record of minus 75C, I did gather a lot of valuable data that will help with future designs and might be helpful to you if you're thinking of building your own pulse tube cooler. At the end of video number two, I had run into a bit of a wall at about minus 75C. What's interesting about this number is that it was the maximum temperature drop I was able to accomplish with either the 25 or 40 millimeter piston configurations. Attempt to input more power actually resulted in a reduction in performance, so something was bottlenecking the cooling power of the device. My initial thought was that choked flow was occurring somewhere in the cooler, causing a limiting effect on volumetric flow rate. The aftercooler heatsink and its adapter seemed like they might be causing the flow restriction, so I machined another heatsink that had larger holes and an adapter with a larger diameter. I was also wondering if maybe the aftercooler wasn't removing enough heat, so I put a second thermocouple on the hot side of the regenerator to see what the temperature going in was. The new assembly was bolted together and sealed up with red silicone, which was pretty ugly, but whatever, it's just a test prototype. The rebuilt version underperformed the previous version by quite a bit. At the top end, the new version produced a temperature drop that was about 25 degrees worse than the previous configuration. Interestingly though, the temp difference between the hot end of the regenerator and the cold end was almost exactly the same as the temp difference between ambient and the cold end on the previous build, which makes me think it had a much more effective aftercooler. And here's the temperature of the hot end of the regenerator. It only gets up to 42C with an ambient temperature of 20C. That's a pretty small difference, but I guess the previous heat exchanger with the tiny holes was getting rid of that extra 20 or so degrees. Next, I made some attempts to pressurize the whole system to increase the power density, but as you can see, I've got some serious leakage, so it was hard to hold pressure for more than 10 or 20 seconds. Despite this, I was able to get a few data points, which, while pretty erratic, were sufficiently clear in demonstrating that increasing the average pressure had a definite effect on performance. So I started building a new version that would be all metal and able to handle pressure without leaking or risking blowing up. For starters, I designed the new heat exchangers to be an array of small diameter copper tubes, which allowed me to make them much longer than the previous ones, which had just been drilled out of a block of aluminum. I drilled 3 quarter inch NPT plugs and soldered in copper tubes with a 2 millimeter inner diameter. These would be connected to a 3 quarter inch NPT cap that were tapped for a 1 8 NPT adapter and soldered to seal up the threads. This adapter would connect to the piston cylinder. On the other end, a 3 quarter inch to 1 half inch stainless coupler would serve as a housing for the regenerator mesh and connect to the pulse tube. The regenerator mesh this time was also stainless due to its lower thermal conductivity than regular steel, which should help performance a little bit. The pulse tube itself was a 1 half inch NPT 4 inch long stainless steel pipe nipple, which I drilled a small hole in for the thermocouple. I sealed off the thermocouple pass through with a ring around the tube that I letter poured epoxy into. This was total overkill, but it definitely worked to hold pressure. The number two heat exchanger on the far side of the pulse tube was identical to the after cooler, using three quarter inch brass plugs and two millimeter inner diameter copper tubes. Finally, the needle valve was connected to a three quarter inch cap that was drilled and tapped for a 1 8 NPT thread. So here's the all metal assembly. And here's the results of the first run with the metal pulse tube assembly at atmospheric pressure. I figure the peak temperature differentials for each frequency are the only relevant points, so I'm going to condense this graph and subsequent graphs down to those points. Okay, so, pretty weak performance so far, topping out at about 22 degrees of drop below ambient. Let's pressurize the system and see what happens. Increasing the average pressure of the working fluid definitely makes a difference and seems to increase the temperature drop more or less proportional to the pressure. However, if I compare these different pressure runs to the configuration from my previous video, we find that I need four atmospheres of pressure to match the same performance that I got with one atmosphere of pressure on the previous build. So what the hell is going on here? So, while the all-metal construction did allow me to pressurize the assembly, it also caused me to lose a lot of power through conduction loss. Stainless steel has one of the lowest thermal conductivities of any metal, but it's still significantly higher than PVC, which I was previously using. On average, stainless steel has a thermal conductivity of about 15 watts per meter Kelvin, while PVC has somewhere between 0.12 and 0.25. That means whatever losses I was incurring from conduction in my previous build are being magnified around 100 fold. I was curious to put a number on the loss, so I actually worked out the math to get an approximate idea. The cold end of the device is losing cooling power in three ways. Axial conduction across the regenerator housing, 
axial conduction along the pulse tube, and radial conduction to the outside world through the walls of the tube. There's some axial conduction across the regenerator mesh too, but it's negligible by comparison. So the regenerator housing has a length of 38 millimeters. The diameter changes throughout its length, but I average the outer diameter to about 26 millimeters and the inner to 18 millimeters. Dividing cross-sectional area by length works out to 0 0.0073 meters. Multiplying by thermal conductivity gives 0.11 watts per degree of difference across the housing. The pulse tube has a length of 100 millimeters, a 21 millimeter outer diameter, and a 14.5 millimeter inner diameter, which works out to 0 0.027 watts per degree of difference. For the radial conduction, I use the average temperature difference along the length of the elements. For the pulse tube, I get 11.5 watts per degree of difference, and for the regenerator housing, I get 4 watts per degree of difference. So when I tally everything up, that comes out to 15.6 watts of conduction loss per degree of difference, the majority of which is being caused by radial conduction through the walls of the pulse tube. Now a lot of that is offset by the fact that I've insulated the outside of the metal, but even a few watts of loss makes a big difference in the max temperature drop since I have such a small amount of cooling power with this device. I guess I'll have to table the all-metal construction until I have a more powerful design, so I converted the pulse tube and regenerator housing back to PVC like I had before, but kept the new heat exchangers. Let's see how that turned out. That was much better, and this time I managed to exceed the performance from last video's design at least up to 13 Hz. I also managed to seal the new PVC design well enough that I was able to do some pressurized runs and it did significantly better at two atmospheres, topping out at 87 degrees of drop below ambient at 13 Hz. Performance at the low end was even better at three atmospheres, but past 11 Hz it seemed to converge on the same results as the two atmosphere run. Like in the last video, I also did tests with a 40mm diameter air cylinder, so here's the results of that configuration at one atmosphere and at 1.5 atmospheres. Past 1.5 atmospheres, my motor wasn't able to provide enough torque to keep the cooler going. Now this graph may make it look like we're on a nice upward trajectory with the cooling performance, but now let's look at those runs on a power versus temperature drop graph. Here's 1, 2, and 3 atmospheres on the 25mm air cylinder. We can clearly see that not only does the pressurized system increase the temperature drop, but it also does so more efficiently. Now here's the plots running on the 40mm air cylinder at 1 and 1.5 atmospheres. In all cases, the temperature drop seems to level off after about 80 degrees of difference and we rapidly run into diminishing returns. This sudden flat line left me scratching my head. There must have been some other factor causing a bottleneck on the performance. Maybe it was the heat exchanger or the regenerator, or maybe it had something to do with the inertance tube ge geometry. For example, here's the performance with the buffer tank connected directly to the orifice valve and the inertance tube removed. In this case, we see that the performance for the lower power levels basically matches the previous curve, but after about 30 watts of input, the curve suddenly starts leveling off. It seems like in an ideal case, the temperature drop versus power input should be a logarithmic curve, something like this, which is kind of consistent with the inverse of the Carnot limit for coefficient of performance of a refrigerator. Up to a point, the data seems to follow that curve pretty well until it flatlines. Well, considering the addition of an inertance tube caused the cooler to follow that theoretical curve much longer, maybe a larger diameter and or longer tube would improve performance. So I got this 10 meter roll of silicone tubing which has an inner diameter of 3 8 inch or 9.5 millimeters. Theoretically, the larger diameter should incur less loss for a given roughness, even if the length had to be increased to keep the same inertance. But as we can see, the new inertance tube underperformed the quarter inch copper tubing at all the different lengths I tested. My suspicion here is that a lot of the acoustic power that would have otherwise been reflected back into the pulse tube was dissipated by deforming the material because the tubing flopped around a lot. I think if I had rigid copper tubing that was 3 8 or 1 half inch diameter, I would see a performance improvement, but I didn't get around to that in this video. However, the silicone tubing still did outperform the case with no inertance tube at all, showing that it would be a worthwhile addition if I had nothing else to work with. Maybe the issue is heat dissipation. While the current tube array heat exchanger should be around three times more effective than the drilled block from my previous video, it's possible that it's still not enough to do the trick. To increase the internal surface area but also have the best possible conduction to the outer walls, I took a half inch copper pipe and stuffed it tightly with copper mesh which is commonly used in distillation columns. This is similar to the way the regenerator is made, with the difference being that we want as much conjunction as possible. Hmm. No real improvement there. In fact, it seemed like it slightly underperformed the tube array, possibly because of the increase in flow resistance. Speaking of flow resistance, the regenerator also produces quite a bit of it. 
I have 8 grams of stainless steel wool packed very tightly into the regenerator housing, so I wonder if reducing that down to 2 grams in the same space would improve my performance. Definitely not. Looks like the increased thermal mass and surface area was worth the pressure drop. I also tried different regenerator materials like tiny beads of glass, ceramic, or plastic, but they all underperform the stainless steel wool by quite a bit. This struggle to break through around 100 degrees of drop below ambient got me thinking I might be better off taking the parts I'm using and building an alpha type sterling cooler with them. In theory that should be more efficient because the expansion part of the cycle all goes into work that's put back into the system by the cold expander piston, whereas in the pulse tube a lot of the work is lost as heat through the orifice valve and secondary heat exchanger. Also, adjusting the phase angle would be trivial since all I'd have to do would be loosen a set screw on the crankshaft. So I shuffled some things around and turned the cooler into an alpha sterling. Simply by manually pumping the compression piston, I immediately started seeing some temperature drop, so that seemed pretty promising. Conversely, manually pumping the expansion piston reversed the cycle and turned it into a heat pump, causing the temperature to rise. This design seemed like it had some potential. However, the temperature drop wasn't even comparable to my runs with the pulse tube. I never managed to get more than about 12 degrees of drop below ambient. I fiddled around with the different angles between the expander and the compressor cylinder and with pressurization, but it didn't make much of a difference. My suspicion is that the uninsulated cold expander piston was conducting away all the cooling generated by the cycle, similar to the problem I had with the stainless steel pulse tube, but even worse. This unexpected result made me curious about just how much power was actually being put into the thermodynamic cycle versus what was just being wasted on mechanical linkages, motor loss, piston friction, and so forth, so I did several test runs with the loads removed from the piston for both 25 and 40 millimeter diameters, and runs with the pistons disconnected entirely to isolate the friction losses. So here are the results, complete with some nifty curve fits so I can interpolate for different frequencies. At 13 Hz, over 80 watts of power is being wasted with the 40 millimeter piston and about 35 watts with the 25 millimeter piston. In green, we can see the losses with the piston disconnected, so after subtracting that power out, we're left with friction generated by the pistons. At 13 Hz, we're burning up almost 19 watts of power from friction on the 25 millimeter piston and a whopping 66 watts of power from friction on the 40 millimeter. Not only is that reducing efficiency, but that's all power being converted into heat, which the aftercooler has to get rid of in addition to the heating from compression. Again, looking at 13 Hz, the 40 mm piston setup consumed a total of 125 watts, but since we know that 89 of that was from losses in the system, that means only 36 watts of pneumatic power was actually being put into the thermodynamic cycle, so even if 100% of that 36 watts was being converted to cooling power, that means the whole system is only 29% efficient in an absolute best case. Now let's compare that to the 25 mm piston pressurized to two atmospheres. In this case, we're consuming 58 watts at 13 hertz, but we know from the data earlier that there's 41 watts of loss, so only 17 watts of power is actually being put into the cooling cycle. Interestingly though, this still comes out to about 29% efficiency in a best case, but let's look at the difference in temperature differentials versus the power inputs. In the 40 millimeter piston, 36 watts of pneumatic power is generating a temperature drop of 97 degrees, whereas in the 25 millimeter piston pressurized to two atmospheres, only 17 watts of pneumatic power is generating a temperature drop of 87 degrees. The pressurized 25 millimeter piston generated almost twice the temperature drop per unit power absorbed than the 40 millimeter piston at one atmosphere, which explains the behavior of the curve on the power versus temperature drop graph. The takeaway here is that running at a higher average pressure seems to be far more important for performance than simply increasing the compression ratio as I speculated in my previous video. This is pretty consistent with what we see in actual Stirling or pulse tube cryocooler units where the pressure ratio generated in each cycle is relatively modest, maybe even under 10%, but the baseline pressure is anywhere from 10 to 30 atmospheres inside the unit, so power density is dramatically increased. The last thing I want to look at in this video is the so-called double inlet. This is an element of a lot of pulse tube coolers that's used to increase their efficiency by making a direct connection between the after cooler and the warm end of the pulse tube with a throttling valve to limit gas flow. By bypassing something like 5 to 10% of the gas flow past the pulse tube, the phase between pressure and gas flow can be improved a little bit and it takes some of the load off the regenerator because otherwise there's a certain percentage of warm gas in the system that will flow through the regenerator but not produce any useful cooling power, so it's basically parasitic. 
If the double inlet is designed right, diverting this parasitic gas volume can improve performance by quite a bit. For my double inlet, I just snipped one of the heat pipes on both of my heat exchangers and tied them together with a needle valve. Not very pretty, but remember, it's just a prototype. In this example, I've been holding at minus 6.4 C for a few minutes, but when I crack open the double inlet valve by about one turn, the temperature immediately drops by about one and a half degrees. Then, when I close it again, it immediately starts returning to the original temperature. Here's a comparison on a graph between having the double inlet valve open versus closed. While the difference isn't particularly impressive, it is pretty consistent throughout the curve. The last thing I wanted to demonstrate was how compression ratio alone doesn't really do much for cooling performance, contrary to my speculation in previous videos. Here I've got a 63mm bore 200mm stroke piston with a displacement of around 600cc connected to my pulse tube assembly, and I wanted to see what happens to the temperature if I crank it by hand. I'm pumping pretty hard and putting a ton of energy into the system, but the temperature stays almost completely steady, whereas with the tiny little 25mm piston with a 50mm stroke, I could drop it almost 100 degrees C. As I learn more about thermoacoustics, I'm beginning to understand that acoustic systems like pulse tubes are very dependent on impedance matching similar to how AC electronic circuits are. A compressor will have a certain output impedance, and a pulse tube assembly with its heat exchangers, regenerator, inertance tube, and compliance volume will have a certain input impedance. These impedances need to be relatively well matched in order for a reasonable amount of power from the compressor to be transferred into the pulse tube to generate useful cooling, and that's obviously not happening with the giant air cylinder I just showed. I should also point out that all of my data points were taken after allowing temperature to settle for 5 minutes. This was done in the interest of time because there were so many test points to record, but as you can see from this example here, temperatures didn't reach equilibrium until around 30 to 40 minutes. This means I could potentially reach much lower temperatures than those shown in earlier graphs. One final point is that all of these temperature drops were below ambient, but the heat exchangers were quite a bit higher than ambient temperature. For example, in this run here, the cold temperature was minus 56 C, but the hot temperature was a toasty 54 resulting in a drop from hot to cold of about 110 degrees. In my previous video, the cold end dropped to minus 75 C, while ambient temperature was 22 C, a drop of 97 degrees. However, the hot end was in excess of 60 C, meaning the total difference was at least 135 C. If the heat exchangers were given a good water cooling system, or even cooled with chilled water, they could be brought down to nearly 0 C, meaning maybe that minus 75 C could theoretically become minus 135 C. This is something I'll be investigating further in future videos. In my next video, I'll be investigating the performance of a pulse tube that uses digitally controlled valves connected to an air compressor as a source of pressure oscillations. This configuration is typically a little less efficient, but because my high pressure source will be a 1400 watt compressor, I'll still have much more power overall, and this might bring me much closer to my goal of minus 196C. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you in part 4.